Good morning. Good morning. Good to be back with you today. You know, the wife and kids down in Lakeland this weekend, they uh, are finally all better. It seemed like they hadn't been off medicine all year. Um, and so uh, they've been asking to go see Mimi and Pops for a long time, and so they were finally better, and Aaron was better, and so they took off. It's been lonely. It's been quiet, though. That's been nice. I'm not superstitious. Maybe a little stitious, right? I'm not superstitious. <coughs> and I don't think that any of us are really all that into superstition. I don't know. Maybe you are. Okay? Uh, I... Not that I'm so educated to believe that, uh, you know, it's more of a, that makes sense to me. You know, it doesn't matter if I wear uh, the same pair of socks. Uh, the Gators aren't going to win anymore just because of that. Okay? But there are some things, though, that I do find myself um, thinking that if I do, then I'll get a different outcome. And it's silly stuff, really. Um, you know, and I, and I was thinking of trying to think of a good example, and, and usually it's nothing that I can really put my finger on. It's just like, well, if I do this, then, you know, maybe this will happen. And it's nothing that I can really say this is a pattern of behavior. It's really more of a in-the-moment kind of a thing. And we kind of do that all the time, don't we? So good luck. No, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Luck doesn't have anything to do with it. Maybe the providence of God. But not luck. But we do have this, uh, in, in general, in our society, uh, an idea of uh, if we say the right thing or if we act in a certain way, then we'll get the outcome that we want. And that stems from uh, many different things, but a lot of it comes from paganism. If I, if I uh, sacrifice this kind of animal, well, you didn't give more money for that sheep and so now that God's going to not be as pleased with you or um, you know if we say these these words and this prayer to this God so just right and just this many times then we'll get this outcome and we, we think of magic words too I don't know where my kids got this from but if they're pretending to do something and all magical magical yeah and that's the magic words it used to be abracadabra I don't know what happened Open sesame. We look here in Matthew chapter 6, though, as Jesus is instructing in his sermon there on how to pray. And as we look at this, we're going to look at the context in just a minute uh, of, of leading up to his, his model prayer, as it's been titled in many, in many of the Bibles that you're looking at. Uh, but it wasn't that he was given this magic formula. Hey, pray this prayer, and this will be the outcome. If you say these words, then this is what's going to happen. You'll get all of your, all of your wildest dreams will come true. That's not really what was going on here. He was approached, and, and it's not the only time where they've asked, Hey, teach us how to pray. I think we can learn something from the fact that he was teaching how to pray. And that it's something that you need to learn. Uh, our boys say the prayer for the evening meal. <laughs> and usually they all do it. You know, it's like we can barely, sometimes I'm still over getting a drink. And they just start in, praying. Hold on, man. Relax. Let's all get around here so we can. And, and they, they go through. And, and Colin has started to branch out and say different things and pray for different people and and, uh, and circumstances. Uh, Henry and Teddy, though, they're still sort of that age where they say mostly what their big brother says. Teddy, though, I don't know if it's his personality because I don't remember the other ones doing this. But it's like he knows he's got us. <laughs> and he drags that thing out. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. The, the dinner's getting cold. Let's move along here, you know. And we'll give him some prompts just to kind of start to wrap it up. And he just sort of looks there. And then he'll say something else and something else. And it's like, all right, man, it's been three minutes just on you. Let's move this thing along. This is prayer for dinner. You're saying the same thing that your other two brothers said, but he knows that he's got us captivated and we can't go on without him finishing up and saying the final amen. And so he just sort of drags this thing out. The good news is they're quiet, so, you know, there's that plus too. 
But it's it's almost this idea that, that we 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 don't realize that it is something that we need to teach, something we need to learn how to pray, the things that we should be praying for, why we pray, and that's the context of this scene here, this point in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount of hey, prayer is important. Prayer is important, and it's a learned behavior or a learned trait or a learned aspect of how to worship. And the context of that is, is we see the, the verses leading up, verses 5 through 8. He says, and when you pray, you might not, must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. What would happen was, and similar to the way he addresses giving, where these rich guys would come in with these all this money and they would wait until everybody was around so they could see him dumping all this gold in. And Jesus says, well, look at this other widow woman, this poor widow, and she drops in. Who gives more? That was a trick question. But what would happen is, is that these, these big wigs, these Pharisees, would wait and there was this gong that would sound. And it was, it was to sim, uh, signal that, hey, this is a time where you... It started out as a hey, let's remember to pray at this time, but then it turned into a, it turned into a, uh, uh, you're going to pray at this time according to the Pharisees. But what would happen is they would plan their trip, it would, where wherever they were going, and they would plan it around the timing of this gong, so that they would be in the center city square market area on a corner, a busy corner. So when they that gong would go, they would have to stop and they would make this big long, loud prayer on the street corner so they could be seen by others. Not because they were wanting to pray to God. Not because they thought that their prayer was effective, but so they would be seen. They were hypocrites. But when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is an instruction necessarily that the only time you should pray, uh, never in public. We said, we've said several public prayers this morning. Not we're breaking. It's not this isn't a commandment that we've been breaking. It's the attitude. Here's what the hypocrite does. But here's what you should do. You shouldn't be like the hypocrites. Don't act like that. If you need to, go to your closet and close the door and pray in secret. And there's a difference between public prayer and private prayer, absolutely. And when you pray, in verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. The Gentiles were superstitious. Paganism in and of itself is kind of a superstitious way of religion, a way of worshiping. Make up this God that, that is going to do something that you want Him to do. And you make up all these rituals that's going to make that God do what you want Him to do. And he, he says there that the Gentiles think that, that by coming in and they say these big long phrases. Magical, magical, make my wish happen. And it'll happen. No, that's not the point of prayer. That's not what we're supposed to do. It's not some phrase, this, this, this chant that we say, and then all of a sudden, all of our dreams come true. Jesus is indicating that that's not the purpose of prayer. It's not so that you can be seen by other people, and it's not to make God do what you want him to do, because he already knows what you need. He already knows that you need to eat, and that you need to be healthy, and that you need shelter. He even says, don't you know that... He's going to take care of the birds of the air, grass of the field. How much better are you? How much more important are you than they? If he knows they need to be taken care of, certainly you're going to be taken care of. We see these circumstances concerning this, uh, these empty phrases that would be repeated or, or being seen by men. And, and it's not even so much, a, one, one last little thing there about keeping up empty phrases. I used to think that every time I prayed, it had to be different. Otherwise, it'd be vain repetition. It's not the repetition that's the, the problem. It's the vain repetition. 
In fact, I used to think uh, when, when we would, in football, would gather around and say this before the football game, and we would, we would quote this prayer here in Matthew chapter 6, that we shouldn't do it for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about in just a minute, but, but the main one was because it was vain, repetition. If it was repetition, we shouldn't do that. But it's not the, the repetitious part of it in John, James excuse me, chapter 5, verse 16, and those verses surrounding that. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is great power and is working. I don't know about you, but I've sinned more than once. I've said that prayer many times, haven't I? Forgive us of our sins. Or thank you for something. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the day. It's not so much that we're repeating. This isn't the, the problem that Jesus had with the Gentiles in this empty, vain repetition of saying the same thing, but the vain part, the not thinking about it. And we can do that in all aspects of worship, can't we? The trays just came by. Not think, just take and put the bread in your mouth, take and drink the little cup and be done and move on and not really think about what we're praying, not thinking about the songs that we're singing, the words that we're, what they mean. We can be vain, repetitious all the time. We can sing the same song every Sunday and it not be vain. It'd be repeating. But when Jesus there gives us this instruction, I would say that this is a prayer, not so much a, 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 the phrasing that we should have or that we should say this specific prayer, but I do think that this is a prayer that we can say today. This is a model, a template, a formula of the types of things that we can and should be praying to God the Father for. Pray like this, he says in verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And many, many versions say, and thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's the template. That's the formula. The kinds of things that we, as citizens of the kingdom, can and should be praying for. A meaningful prayer. One uh, prayer that is going to be heard by God. One that's going to be answered by God for those who are faithful and righteous. We have a God that wants to hear from us. He gives us this example, one to follow. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I love Romans chapter 8. There's a lot of good stuff in that chapter. And the one I want to look at here, verse 26, likewise, I love this passage of Scripture. Because I'm, sometimes there's things that I want to say that I can't figure out how to say. I'm not even talking about just in prayer. I'm talking about in general. And he says, likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what, we pray, uh, what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You ever felt that way? You just don't know what to say. You know you need to say a prayer. You know that there's, it's weighing heavy on your heart. And you just don't know how to say the words. You might not even know what's wrong. Or maybe you do and you just don't know how to start. And we're told here in Romans that the Spirit knows and intercedes for us with those groanings too deep for words. Amen. That's a great feeling. It's a great thing to know as Christians that we have an intercede uh, an intercessor to go to God for us in Jesus Christ but also in the spirit to know what we ought to say or rather because we don't know what we ought to say Jesus introduces at the very beginning of this prayer a radical idea have you picked it out yet it's been read twice father who art in heaven Hallowed be. What's, so, what's radical about that? Well, I think for us, it's hard for us to really think that there was anything shocking about that statement. But at this point in time, 
it would have been shocking for Jesus to identify God as Father. In fact, the Jews, the Pharisees, even Israel, didn't use God's name. They had another name for it. To, so they wouldn't use his real name in vain. And so it, was, it would have been shocking for these Jews and Pharisees that may have been listening at this point. They hear Jesus identify God, the one whom we don't even use the name for fear of using it in vain, to, to call him Father. And in fact, Jesus always addresses God as the Father, the Heavenly Father, the Good Father. All except for the one time on the cross when he says, Abba, Father. Which was an affectionate way uh, that, that Jewish boys and girls would say to their father. Dad. Or Dad. Every time there, Jesus identifies God as Father. We can speak to God as Father. Because he is our Heavenly Father. He's a loving, caring father who wishes to have a relationship with us. He says there, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I remember, I remember growing up being taught that this was something that we couldn't say. This was why we didn't say the Lord's Prayer. Because, well, his kingdom has already come. We're in it, right? The church, the kingdom of heaven. And yet I, I would say that we can say this. This is something that we should be praying in a couple of, in a couple of ways that we, should, we could be praying this. While, yes, in this room right now, we are the kingdom of heaven, what about next door? So we could pray, your kingdom come as we bring the truth of God's word. Add in those lost souls through baptism. We could be bringing the kingdom. But also, we know that we are Christians who are without a home. John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Matthew 25 speaks more specifically. Verse 34, then the king will say to those who are on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We are, we are Christians in a kingdom that are on our way home. And so we could pray this prayer with the idea of Jesus, come quickly. Bring us home to heaven. We could pray this prayer with the idea of be with me in boldness as I go and preach the gospel to spread your kingdom to all the world as I go. When we approach God's throne, we're not asking that he lend power to our will, but rather that our will be changed to his. Because just as we want the kingdom to go, and we want Jesus to come, it's his will, not my will. How often do we pray? And we ask for things that are not related to the spreading of the kingdom, which is our number one purpose, to be Christians and to teach the lost. But we pray not with the motive that God's will be done, but it's, it's my will that I want done. Jesus instructs us in this template prayer that we can, we can have an advocate in the Father, that he wants to hear from us, that he is holy above all, but that it's not what we want, but it's what he wants for us. Are we adjusting our will to be God's will? Or are we trying to twist God's will into our will thinking that if we pray it, then it'll happen. We're going to look at the end of the lesson there about if we ask anything in the Father's name through Jesus Christ, then it'll be given. That is said throughout Scripture. In fact, in James, he gives several examples of the, the prophet who prays, and for three years it doesn't rain. And then when he prays, it rains. 
It wasn't that the prophet wanted it to have a, there, there to be a drought in the land. It was God's will. His power was shown. It wasn't that Moses uh, spoke to the rock so he could look powerful and water come out so that Israel could drink water and they could be, uh, you know, their, their thirst could be slated. It was to show God's power. That was God's will. It wasn't the words that Moses said. It wasn't the prayer that was spoken. It was God's will that it would be done. And it was asked in God's will. The, the, the attitude was that God's will be done. We can't twist. We can't twist God's will through prayer. We can't make God do anything. If our attitude is in our daily life, but especially in prayer, that it doesn't matter what happens. There was a, a family that I knew that the, there was a young family and the, the mom was sick with cancer. She had had cancer and it was beaten and was gone for a number of years. Cancer free. And then it came back. And it got real bad. And she was fighting it hard. And she had asked the elders to come over and they prayed. And I remember one uh, Wednesday night, one of the elders got up and said, there's been a request that we pray for her so that she could be well and have more time with her children. And so that was the prayer. And I thought, you know, that's a, that's a good prayer to pray. That's a righteous prayer to pray. And it wasn't that, that uh, it, was, it was God's will that she die or not die. It wasn't God's will that she be punished or, or rewarded. The attitude in the prayer when it was spoken was that we want her to be well. To be a part of a children's life. But even if the answer is no. We know that you are in control. She lived a little bit longer. And it wasn't the attitude following that, that the answer was no and God's terrible. The attitude was in the congregation that, well, it was God's will. We need to figure out how to move on and make this our will as well. That's hard. It's hard because sometimes we think we know what's best, don't we? We don't, have, we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. God does. Give us this day our daily bread. And this one that we always pray real quick. Thank you for the food. And move on. What's the, what's the message here, though? I think maybe it's that there's nothing too common to bring to God in prayer. Oftentimes we wait until it's, the, it's something's too late. It's like, well, there's nothing else, so let's pray. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Hear me when I cry. We almost, it's like we wait until we're in crisis mode to finally break down and pray. But I, I would think that the reason that this is in here, it's not so much that, that we uh, need to you know, thank God for the, the food that we're going to eat because otherwise we won't have it. But it's a, an attitude of thanksgiving, of thanking God, even, even for the small things, because it's not a thank you for all the food that we have and we're fat and happy, but it's simple daily bread. The little things to be thankful for. How often we forget to go back and thank God for those things. To thank Him for taking care of us, of giving us food and shelter. So those things we kind of take for granted sometimes. That we don't think about thanking Him for. But also this idea that it's, it's a little thing, but we still are needing God. If you were to ask anybody, a Christian or otherwise, how do you, how do you survive? Well, I got a job and they give me money. And I pay the, the mortgage or the rent, and I pay the car, and I pay for gas and food, and I, and I, and I, and I. Is it? Or is it God who gives us our daily bread? It's 
God who takes care of us. And nothing is too small to bring to him in prayer. Nothing is too small for him to care about. Because he cares for us. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Parable of the unforgiving servant. We're not going to spend a lot of time looking at this. It's a shocking, it's a shocking parable. Of, of a guy who has a, an unpayable debt. Never be able to pay it. In several lifetimes. And he's forgiven. The master says, done. Don't worry about it. And then he goes out and he chokes his, his fellow servant uh, for lunch money. Well, the, the first servant who was forgiven gets thrown into prison until he can pay it off, which he's not able to. How can we expect to be forgiven if we are not forgiving our fellow man, our fellow Christians? How can we expect to have God forgive us our sins unless we forgive those who sin against us? That's a simple concept, but difficult to implement, isn't it? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. A prayer of strength when we are tempted. Because we are going to be tempted. James tells us that, that we're tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Lead us not into temptation is not a, not a prayer that God is going to not lead us into temptation. Because he doesn't tempt us. But rather, that there will always be a way of escape. As Paul says to the Corinthians, there's always going to be a way of escape. We never have to give in to temptation. There's not going to be a case in our life where we're going to be saddled with some sort of decision where there is only bad choices. There's only sinful choices. There will always be a way of escape. We might not like the way of escape. It might cause us some discomfort. It might cause us to be shunned by our neighbors and family, but there will always be a way of escape, and we're not going to be tempted beyond what we can bear. We see Job being tempted. I don't know how he did that. I don't know how he struggled the way he struggled and was still able to keep his faithfulness to God. When we see a man like Job, who was successful, who was being directly attacked by the devil, and yet he was still successful. This is a prayer that we should pray on a daily basis. Maybe not these specific words, but maybe if it's something that helps remind us of the things we should pray, maybe that is something we should start. Maybe if we have struggled with praying on a regular basis to God about the big things or the little things, maybe a good place to start, a good reminder to pray to God because one, He is holy. Another good place to start would be that we bring the kingdom of heaven to the world and that Jesus is coming back one day. To pray for those little things like our daily bread. That nothing is too small or too big for God to handle. We pray for forgiveness of sins. Because we need to be reminded that God forgave our sins and so we should be forgiving others as well. These aren't magic words. These aren't a phrase that we should repeat constantly because if we do, then we'll get the outcome that we want. That's not Jesus' point here. Why should we pray then? We should approach the throne of grace with boldness, as the Hebrew writer says in 4, 15, and 16. But I want to read to you 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, and then the lesson will be yours. I write these things to you believe, uh, who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God and will, God will forgive him his life. To those who commit sin that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I don't talk about that, that I should pray for that. There are things that we shouldn't pray for. Things we, it wouldn't matter if we prayed for. But we do have a, a template of things that we 
should and can pray for. And there's a lot of reasons that we should pray. Because it's a acceptable worship to God. Because he wants to hear from his children. But how about because he answers prayer? Because if we ask it in his name, with his will in mind, it will be granted to us. There's prayers that people pray all the time and think that they're not answered. Perhaps somebody's praying that they could be shown the way of truth. Are you bringing the kingdom to the world to answer those prayers? You can have your sins forgiven and enter into the kingdom of heaven and be a part and have your prayers answered. Or if you do need the prayers of the church this morning.